Hello, I'm David DeCosmo. Welcome to Preview, Electric City Television's public affairs program. We have got a wonderful and very unusual program for you this week, and our guest is George Horwath from the uh, Welsh Cultural Endeavor of Northeastern Pennsylvania. George, welcome to the program. Thank you, David. Good you to know, see you again. You I, I know, think, I think it'd be really tough to find anybody that hasn't heard stories about King Arthur. You know, they remember the show Camelot, uh, always uh, associated with those years of, of uh, John Kennedy and, and uh, Jacqueline. And yet I would venture to say that most people would think, well, you know, King Arthur and Camelot, that's, that's a play, that's a story. That's not true. You have spent literally years doing some investigatory work that shows that, in fact, a lot of it is true, but that there's more to it than we would ever imagine. Now, first of all, when we think Camelot, we think uh, King Arthur, we think of England. But as you and I chatted just before we went on, England, as we know it today, didn't really exist then. There was no England. There was no England recognized until probably around 1066. This goes back to the third, fourth, and uh, say third, fourth, fifth, sixth century. So it was Britain. It was the original inhabitants of the Cymry who were the Welsh. They were the original inhabitants of, of what we know as Britain. Britain named from Brutus, who was the first king of Britain uh, brought in by the uh, Etruscans. Well then, the bottom line for our conversation, was there a King Arthur, was there a Camelot? Well, absolutely, and there's a lot of folklore, a lot of myth, and a lot of just pure deception. There were actually two King Arthurs. They're six generations apart. They all emanate from Constantine the Great. Back, it can be traced back to the Holy Family. So the whole lineage of the Welsh kings, the bishops, all came from the same, uh, same bloodlines. And you went to Wales to begin your investigation as to these these stories. Uh, uh, let me ask one more question. Was there a round table? Uh, most likely. We, we know where the site is and if it were excavated and unearthed, um, I, I think you could find something there, yeah. You, you, one of the, the photos, and you've taken a lot of photos on your travels, uh, I'm going to try to hold this one up. I'll do it to this camera right over here. Uh, this is a section, what part of Wales would this be in? This is three, about three miles northeast of Cardiff, up what's called Thornhill Road until you can't go anymore. Uh, there's a horse riding stable over here, and then this is a steep mountain. What Camelot really means, it's an anglicized word, it's, it's yellow fortress, Kyre meaning fort, melon meaning uh, yellow. So it's actually called Kyre Melon. But this, this uh, area that we see here, which basically looks uh, rural, looks uh, almost agriculture in nature, this is the site of where Camelot actually was. Yes, in, in fact, in Arthur, this is the second King Arthur, uh, the most common, most well-known Arthur. This was where they believed that the uh, round table, the, Chir the Camelot site was actually right on this spot. Some people tried to excavate it in the 1880s and they were stopped by the government and they weren't issued any permits and they were just told to leave it alone, so. <laughs> so, hand, hands off at that it point. Was, it was actually used, there was a wedding there in the 1500s, so uh -huh. it was recorded, and this is all from the ancient records. This is from yeah. records that you won't find on Google, you won't find on Wikipedia, and it's not myself or anyone that went out and found this. I've been involved in this for seven years. I am the legal representative to Alan Wilson and Baron Blackett, Anthony Blackett, and they have a 40-year uh, investigation into this full-time with their own money, independent funds, just themselves, no, um, no influences, just the facts, and found the records, went as far back into the Holy Lands, Egypt, Greece, Rome, to do a whole complete um, uh, just investigation as, yeah, of the just genealogies of, of the people. And through the records, they have found, uh, for instance, the, the Arthurs. Arthur I, uh, born 345, dies around 400 plus or minus. There are, are six other kings in, in between. The second Arthur is born in 503. He dies in 579. 
So there, could be, there has to be two Arthurs because you have one fighting the Saxons and one fighting the Romans. The, the it can't line, be one yeah. person. Right. They, the Romans were, were defeated and gone by the time the Saxon, Saxon invasions. And there's, there's a whole lot of uh, just absolutely unbelievable lies and whitewashes of the history. It's not true. Anything that's, that's pretty well known is not true. And, and I think because of the, of the musical, uh, the play and the movie Camelot, people have this romantic notion you know, about the whole story. And so they don't, they don't really dig into the, the actual facts that no. lie, lie uh, far deep below. Uh, now, that particular site, you said they weren't really allowed to go in and, and do anything. No. Uh, but if, if there was a country involved, certainly there were, uh, there were some sorts of evidence of what went on there. Uh, and you found some of that evidence, and that's, that's kind of impressive. Uh, I'm gonna hold up another picture. Now, this is a very small picture, <clears throat> so we'll see what we can do, and, and uh, I'll have our technicians tell me if this is gonna work or not. Uh, this small photo shows a couple folks around two stones. Now, tell us, what are we seeing in this photo, uh, George? Well, the one on the left is the gravestone of the second Arthur that was found in South Wales on a place called Minithagire. Uh, Caer Caradig, meaning the um, fortress of um, greatness. The other Minithagire, um, fort well, that's Fortress Mountain. And the one on the right is the gravestone of the, of the first King Arthur that was found in the, what's now the Midlands of England. It was found in a cave. Ah. So there's a little bit of distance there. But again, there was no England. It was just known as Britain or the Cumric people, K-H-U-M-R-Y, K-H-U-M-R-I-C. They were known as the Cumri or the Kimroy as far back as the ancient Assyrians. And even the emperors acknowledged and recognized these people. That's who the original inhabitants were. To have, you know, an actual piece of excavation that is tied to King Arthur, whether it be the first or the second, to me is like having a slab of gold uh, sitting somewhere. And what is very interesting is the fact that that second stone, that larger stone, is now actually in your charge. Yes. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping that someday, you know, in the next year or two, that maybe you'll be able to put together uh, uh, an exhibition where we can have people come in and actually take a look at the, uh, one doesn't put that in his pocket to bring back on the no, airplane. It, uh, <laughs> it was quite, quite a, <clears throat> excuse me, a difficult task just to get it here. And, and what about all the, all the uh, research that went into f you know, really identifying that as, as the stone uh, over the grave of that of Well, that those, those two people are the ones that found this. They, ah. <clears throat> they bought a church uh, that they believed where, this, uh, where these articles were, and that, that second stone was, I believe, retrieved from the ground by Anthony Blackett in 1985, and then they did a, an archeological dig uh, in 1990, Dr. Eric Talbot from the University of Glasgow, and they spent six weeks up there, and they found the lectern cross that corresponds with that stone. I see. So there's many other things there. Um, uh, there were two places of internment uh, uh, where the, um, the stone where Arthur uh, was buried. There were reasons for it. There are poems written. Um, here's 30, 40 lines ex explaining the funeral of Arthur. Arthur's funeral, I'm told, can be proven 10 different ways, the second Arthur. And when you mention Guinevere. Yes, a real character? Well, there were actually, Arthur had three wives. Oh, so. <laughs> and they were all named Guinevere. Oh. <laughs> but that wasn't the name. Her name wasn't Guinevere. It was Gwen with a Y, Gwen with a R, Gwen the Great, Gwen the Large. And he had three different wives. Now, was this the first or the second the Arthur? second Arthur. Second Arthur. So would the second Arthur be the one that we most associate with the play and, and uh, that we've come yes. to? Come to uh, the first Arthur was, was, um, was king and he, he dealt with the Romans. The Romans, by the way, never conquered Britain. That, that's a, a misnomer too. And he ran, he was also king of Gaul, which, you know, is current day France. 
And he had Gratian on the run, the emperor, and drove him out of Gaul and sent him right back into Rome. So that was his plight. So the second Arthur is dealing with the Saxons, defeated them many times, and ran them off uh, successively. He was perhaps the world's greatest king. He was a great military strategist, a very intelligent person, and uh, uh, there's more to this story that I don't care to go into right now, but there's more that involves America, Would, too. would you say that he basically controlled what we now know of as, as that part of Europe? Well, the first Arthur definitely did. The second Arthur, uh, according to the Brutes of England, which is English history, um, they read here, and Arthur had put his knights afield in April after the first sowing he and join into Britain, you can't understand this is ancient, you know, English language, right. Owen right. Lands, and after Whitsuntide, next sowing, by counsel of his barons, he would become king of Glamorgan and Gwent and all of Britain. Sowing, would, would that be an agricultural? Uh, the first planning. Uh, yeah, so first the planning. springtime, he was b perhaps in Brittany, and he was brought back into South Wales and, and uh, coronated as King of Glamorgan and all of Britain. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> this is so fascinating to realize that a story like this has captured our imagination, has such truth behind it, although the, the uh, logistics are a little different than we might have, have, have pictured. It, it almost seems like everything was centered in what we now know as Wales. Yes. And, and do the Welsh people realize no. this? They don't. They do not. Isn't they that don't amazing? understand it. They think that they're Celts and they're not Celts. <coughs> and in this book, earlier books, he believes there were Celts in Britain. And he's corrected his mistakes and said, when we make a mistake, we correct the mistake. But in here he has pages of, they're not Celts. So that upsets a lot of people, the Scots, the Irish. Yeah. The, there were no Celts in the British Isles. Did, did you, were you amazed when you started looking into this and found out all these things? Well, this came to me seven years ago by um, a colleague in Stroudsburg that put me in touch with these people, and I said, I want to know more about this. So in my lifetime, I've had seven trips over there, and I visited with them frequently, and I have all the book rights, movie rights, anything that pertains to this material because they're moving on in age and due to health, and yeah, yeah. they want a presence in the United States. So I assumed that responsibility three years ago, and it's been a very difficult one, and there's... Uh, a lot of consternation associated with it, and it hasn't... Well, you, you kind of you <laughs> tackle some what we thought were uh, accepted facts, uh, if you'll you, pardon the word facts, accepted uh, uh, stories, which actually now we find are not really uh, accurate. Um, you have a couple of pictures that you, you have in the... Now, is this in the area? Explain what this one well, is, if, if you will. My colleague, Alan Wilson, drew off on a map when I was at his house, and he said, here's where I believe the grave site is of King Arthur right now. He said, we kind of were off on our calculations, but he believes it's right on that mound. And in the background there, you can see what a very famous uh, piece of land up there called Old Smoky, but that's the Rhonda Valley in South Wales. Uh -huh. So we came up from the southern end at the top of that mountain, and he drew out where a stream would be, and he said, if we could do a dig there, he said, I believe he'd be under those stones. So whether they are or not, uh, again, this is a culmination of 40 years worth of work. I'm not, uh, I'm not the, um, the researcher. I'm the purveyor of what's here. I understand. They did yeah. the work, and I'm, I've you know, thoroughly gone through this stuff, and I'm convinced it's very accurate. But now I'm wondering, in as much as the attempt to get into the area that uh, you know now as Camelot was sort of thwarted. Uh, I mean, was it even practically considered doing a, a dig to recover remains in an area like that? Or it, it, again, will the government step in and say, no, they'll this stop is, it. They'll stop it. The, 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 the church doesn't want to see this. The academia doesn't want to see this. Why and, is and the that? Government. Wilson believes that it will append the German monarchy that's been on the throne since 1700, 1707, George I. It's been a, a strain of German from uh, George I to Elizabeth, and they don't want this known because history is power. Well, that's and if true, this was yeah. known, um, this could cause problems with, with, with the monarchy. Uh, the, way, the way Wilson explains it to me, they ran out of 
English and Scottish kings, Welsh kings, Henry VII, Henry VIII. And he said, by the time the Scottish kings were dead, that he calls them the mob, the establishment, <laughs> he said, they didn't want any more Catholics. So they go deep into Germany and they find George, George I, who is a um, Saxe, Kotha, Coburg, German, and they figured he was Lutheran. He was like 54th or 55th in line to be king. They bring him over, they, they coronate him as king. He doesn't speak a word of English. <laughs> he goes back to Germany and spends the rest of his life there. So you've had successions down to Victoria and Albert, to the current day monarchy. <laughs> Uh, back, back up a second. That was a pretty impressive uh, elevation to power pretty quickly. This is only what, the, what they've told me. I, you know, yeah. I have all the reference. I have tubs and tubs of material to back this up. I mean, it's not just folklore or anything that, and like I said, if there's something not right, they'll make a correction of it. And uh, this last book seems to have cured a lot of the... <laughs> you, you made reference to, to a, uh, a cave somewhere in this vicinity. Is this near the same no. mountain? No, this is a different no, that's area out entirely. In West Wales. Okay, tell us the story about this, if you will, and, and the, the cave and the church in the area. Well, that's out in a place called Nevern. Uh, Wilson and another man, Richard Wire, who since has passed away, took uh, my wife and I out there. We were out there twice, and they believe that Helen the mother, the Empress of Rome, the mother of Constantine the Great, brought back the cross of Christ and placed it in a, in a it was on parade for a while, but they had, this is mid 300s, and they placed it in a cave eventually in West Wales. And Wilson and Blackett went out and researched the material. They did um, ground pen penetrating radar, found it encased in a non-ferrous metal casing which indicates it's studded with uh, diamonds and pearls and or not pearl, emeralds and non-ferrous metal, you know, perhaps being gold. Oh. And there's a sign out there that says, no archeological digs, no one's to touch this. So I'm not a superstitious person by any means and I don't believe in any of this occult business and what that you see, but around the corner of that cave, we happened to be taking pictures that day we're off the mark here a little bit. Uh, my wife and I went over and took pictures, went down to the local pub, had something to eat, came home and looked and saw on the other side of it some garbage, some debris, and a ho there's a house on the other side. We happened to see an image. I saw it. I a saw horizontal your, I saw image with an eye with three horns, yeah. with three serpents em uh, emerging from the nostrils. Very clear, I have the photo. And I showed this to a ton of people, and about 80% of the people see this. I saw it, yeah. So the next year we go back, and uh, I, I go back with a, another colleague, Richard Wire, and he's a dowser, which I'm not a, a big believer in that kind of stuff, but mm -hmm. the image after taking all those pictures wasn't there. But on the other side of the cave going up to the mount, uh, the little hill there, there was a fortress up there, was known as a Norman fortress. He did discover two tunnels underneath the ground. And 10 days later, since we came back, we couldn't get all this information, but he'd passed away. He was 82 oh. years old and fell off a ladder from a second story oh, window. And my word. The guy was pretty, pretty spry and pretty alert, but he'd, he'd passed on like rather quickly, so. Ended, ended that, that part of the research. There's just some phenomenal occurrences. I've just got to wonder with that that has been found, what might yet remain to be found if you were allowed to do the investigation? It takes money. Mm -hmm. it takes investment. It takes somebody to believe in what you're doing. And uh, they hadn't been successful in 40 years in finding anybody. So what they did, Alan was a uh, a manager who designed and developed shipyards throughout the Mediterranean, Northern Ireland, uh, Newcastle, England, and he was paid very well, and he accumulated a, quite a bit of money. So he decided he didn't want to be in the business anymore. He knew the history of Britain wasn't right. He knew there was a problem, and he and his colleague departed to investigate and see what the truth was, and he invested all of his own money, and he's 
pretty much run out of it. So it's where does it go to the next step? I don't know. What uh, what happened to the first King Arthur? Natural death, as far as we um, know? Or? I'm not really sure. I never spent personally that much time in it, but he says died 400 A.D. plus or minus. So mm -hmm. we know where the second what happened to the second King what, Arthur. What happened to the second King Arthur? Uh, well, I hope you don't fall off your chair. I should have brought the book. <laughs> There were rumors. Last we saw in, 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 and I go back to the play because everybody associates it. And last we saw in that he was he was riding off to battle the forces which were now actually head by Lancelot. I don't yeah. know if there was a Lancelot yes. or not. There was? Yeah, it was a different name, I forget. <laughs> there was actually a Merlin too, and he was the poet Taliesin. There was a Merlin as yes. well. Oh my word. All right, let's get back. Second. This was all taught in the Cardiff schools until about 1922, and all of a sudden it mysteriously disappears from all the history books. It's just like all these sites that I mentioned were on the Ordnance Survey maps, the official ordnance uh, maps, until 1983. By the time 1984 maps come out, they're all obliterated, they're all gone. So, so even the curriculum up until the 20s was was into oh, yeah. this. And all these places I mentioned were on the the, the, the Queen's maps, all the Ordnance Survey maps, and just uh, conveniently disappeared the next day later, or wasn't, next year wasn't later. Wasn't politically correct for oh. the next... <laughs> <laughs> King Arthur II. Okay, last we saw him in the movie and the play, he's riding off to do to do battle. But uh, what actually happened to the second King Arthur? The second King Arthur had a brother by the name of Madoc. There was a Madoc... Uh, at uh, Gwyneth, who allegedly came here in 1170, and they said discovered America. Well, there was nobody of notoriety in North Wales. It was all South Wales, you know, bred people and immigrants that came from the Holy Lands and whatnot. And the Ancient Kentucky Historical Association can back this up in, in Louisville, Kentucky. Another person by the name of Jim Michael wrote a book. They found the ancient Welsh Colburn language out there. They find out that Madoc, the brother of Arthur, the second Arthur, is there in 562. He's there with a, with a contingency of, of people. He's the prince. Arthur has uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, six siblings. And it's Madoc who is in the area of Louisville. The language, the Brandenburg stones are found throughout southern Indiana, Ohio, and there's even a presence in Pennsylvania. Uh -huh. And Arthur comes to see this some years later, and he's murdered. There's a picture found over in mid-England where there's a king with arrows through him. So there were Indians, or Native Americans as you want to say, that Arthur had been killed in Kentucky. His body had been well, mummified. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, well, this, this is deep. You're, you're, saying, mean, you're saying that the King Arthur that we, we know from these correct. stories actually died here in the United That's States. That's right. Before Absolutely before. provable. Absolutely accurate from both sides this of the ocean. This is amazing. This is amazing. So <laughs> his body is mummified, taken back to the area of the Oweni River and is buried between near Ogmore Castle, between the Ogmore and Oweni Rivers. In, in Wales. In, in South Wales, and he's interred in a cave for the first time. Wilson and Black go and investigate the cave. There's all kind of Colburn writing inside the cave that says, yes, this is the first interment of Arthur. He is then moved about 10 miles up on top of the mountain, Fortress Mountain, um, Kyr Caradog, which was named after uh, a first century Welsh king who had a fort up there. And Arthur is now interred near St. Peter's Supermontum Church, Minith Agair. So, which is, yeah. we have on the maps, we have, uh, we've been up there twice, uh, we've seen this. This, this is amazing. <laughs> this, this is amazing. Uh, uh, oh, I know there's people and, and, want to throw the net over me, but it's, but, it's but you've, their work, not I mine. Say, I was going to say, you've gathered all sorts of documentation uh, to support oh, yeah. uh, this it's all story. Here. Um, and, and although you may be working uh, for or with some others, you should be putting a book together right now. They're right here, Dave. Uh, no, right no, here. The, the story that I've just, <laughs> just, just consolidated, you, you've got to put that together. And again, you have... 
uh, the one burial stone. Now, that was the first uh, King Arthur. Second. Oh, that was the second? Uh, you have the stone for the second, which in a sense, in our knowledge, seems the more prominent of, of the two. You've got to get an exposition together. I challenge you within the next year or two. Well, we've attempted it, but well, not very successfully. Well, well so. now I'm, I'm going to lead the charge now and <laughs> see if we can't get some more but, attention. Th these are amazing stories. And again, all of us, I think, are captured with the thought of, of Arthur. And, and it may be the romantic thought from Camelot, but by gosh, some of the information that you present is just as exciting and adventurous and romantic in a, in a long-term uh, sense. So uh, I hope that maybe this story gets told more and more and more. And I they, give you and the others every, every credit. Every one of these books, every one of these books are precisely in um, bibliography, footnoted, highlighted. So there's no conjecture. It's all based on the facts from original ancient records. For instance, where, do, where did they get this information? There's what's called the Harleian Manuscripts, 3859. I have them. They're this long, they're this wide, they're what, this thick. What language? Uh, I'm not really sure. Uh, it's a form of Latin, which Wilson thinks is something called dog Latin, which is way beyond me. And the, a lot of the resources came from the Black Book of Camarthen, the Llandaff uh, Charters, um, Again, the brutes of England, even the English history. All right, we're, but, we're but about way of, back. We're about out of time, so what okay. we've got to do is we've got to get all of this and do a Reader's Digest no. version. I have it. I have <laughs> and, it all. And and uh, and get it get it published, and we've got to get you back here, and maybe I don't know. We're going to have to have a crew come with you to bring the stone, so we can show that. Well, but, but George, I had to buy a mortuary cot to put it on, so it could be <laughs> mobile. <laughs> Thank you so much okay, for joining Dave, us. Okay, Dave, it's great what to be here. What fantastic history and, and information. Uh, we'll look forward to following up on this. Uh, I'm David DeCosmo for Preview on Electric City Television. Till we see you again next time, here's hoping all your news is good.